This video is brought to you by Keeps. Microsoft Binbos. This image for decades has been basically the poster child for what constitutes a crappy off-brand. Pointed to time and time again as a classic example of a bootleg knockoff thing. Heck, on the subreddit r crappy off brands, Microsoft Bimbos is notorious for being one of the most common reposts in the history of the sub. Now I love this image, I have always loved this image, and as weird as it is to think about, I've technically loved this image for most of my life. It's one of the earliest funny images I remember seeing on the internet, and to this day, just hearing or seeing the words Microsoft Bimbos still makes me lose it. Now they say nothing ruins a joke like explaining it, so I'm not even gonna try, which is a relief, I guess, because I don't think I could even articulate why Microsoft Bimbos is so damn funny to me. Like, just on a basic phonetic level, the phrase Microsoft Bimbos is, I think, inherently hilarious. Just a purely nonsensical phrase, likely the result of a mistranslation. Or was it? The question I want to pose to you today is, what if Microsoft Bimbos isn't nonsense? What if all the millions of people who have shared and enjoyed this image over the years and shrugged it off as a funny, crappy off-brand, what if, far-fetched though it may sound, virtually everyone on the internet was wrong and Microsoft Bimbos actually meant something? And hey, while we're throwing out questions here, here's one that doesn't get asked enough. What the hell was Microsoft Bimbos? Was it a company, a bootleg operating system? What, what was it specifically? And last but not least, where was it? Where was this enormous multi-foot Microsoft Bimbos sign? And perhaps most crucial of all, was this photo real? With only one photo of Microsoft Bimbos in existence, you, you kind of got to ask yourself at a certain point, did it ever really exist at all? Or was this whole thing just a silly early internet Photoshop job that spiraled way out of control? Today, I intend to answer each and every one of these questions or die trying. This is the story of Microsoft Bimbos. So let's jump right into my first point. What does Microsoft Bimbos mean if it means anything at all? At first glance, you can see how the average English speaking person, myself included, would just automatically assume that this is a lazy knockoff of Microsoft Windows with some letters shuffled around. You know, the classic change up the homework a bit so it's not obvious you copied thing like off brands so often tend to do. But that's not what's going on here, not by a long shot. Microsoft Bimbos, in fact, is not nonsense. These words weren't chosen at random, and if you dig a little deeper, you'll see what I mean. Let's quickly dive in and just translate some of the Japanese text on this image. The katakana at the very top of this banner says Chuko Pasokan and Patsu Shop, basically used PC and parts shop. Meanwhile, the enormous kanji on the left of the banner reads Gekiyasu, which means cheap or bargain price. So at this point, we're getting a clearer picture of what this was, right? It was a used shop that sold PC parts, but I hear you screaming, why Microsoft Binbos? So here's my favorite part. Binbo is actually a Japanese word meaning poor or poverty. So in actuality, it's a bilingual pun. They've combined the English word Windows and the Japanese word Binbo to make Binbos. 99.9% .9 of people who see this image don't get this. It's not a typo or a knockoff or an error. It's a pun, a play on words suggesting, hey, if you're broke, come by and check out our dirt cheap used PC parts. So at this point, I think the elephant in the room is Microsoft. Well, here's what I can tell you. In Japan, Microsoft's name is written like this, Mikuro Sofuto. Now that name consists of seven katakana, Ma, I, Ku, Ro, So, Fu, and To. Now, here's where it gets a little speculative. Michael is an incredibly common English name, and it's one of those names that is so prevalent in Western culture that it's actually seeped its way into the lexicon in Japan. 
For a great example of what I'm talking about, look at the P. Lander Z song, So Many Mike, which is literally about how confusing it is that all Americans seem to be named Michael. So many Mike, so many Mike, ah, 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 don't confuse me. So, because Michael is such a common name among gaijin, it's a name that Japanese people are all too familiar with writing out in katakana. And when you write the name Michael out in katakana, you end up with this. Ma i keru. Now one big difference between Japanese and English is that spoken Japanese is tied incredibly closely to written Japanese, and it affects the way their puns work. The reason Microsoft is an effective pun in Japanese is because you only have to change two katakana to make it work, despite the fact that Michael and Micro are extremely different looking words in English. In fact, at the bottom of the sign, that's what that katakana says. It says Microsoft. So that's two questions down, what Microsoft Bimbos means, it's a pun, and what Microsoft Bimbos was, a used computer gear shop. But that still leaves one glaring question, where is this place located, besides Japan? I mean, if this place exists at all, where is it? Is it still there? Like, for real, drop, drop a pin. Like, I know some Melee players who would pay real large sums of money to get their hands on those CRT monitors, all right? So just after looking into this for a while, I initially concluded that this would be impossible to answer. I have a lot of videos that kind of fizzle out this way where I get halfway through solving a mystery or answering a question and then surrender to the fact that it's unknowable. Punching Microsoft bimbos into Google Maps results in, of course, nothing. And on reflection, trying to find info about Microsoft bimbos was tricky for two reasons, I think. First, the ubiquitousness of this image. This image is all over the internet. It's been uploaded to every single funny picture website, complete with their watermark slapped on it, over and over and over. That makes it incredibly hard to track down. Which leads me to the second reason it's almost impossible to research Microsoft bimbos, the age of this image. I mean, remember, this photo is older than YouTube, older than Reddit, and older than, frankly, a significant chunk of the people watching this video right now. It's been reposted over and over and over for two, two decades. decades, meaning this image has circulated so much that it has long, long since become completely detached from its source. Anytime you see the Microsoft Bimbo's image, you're looking at a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Every time you see this image, it's been reposted and recompressed dozens, likely even hundreds of times, and it shows. While working on this video, I, I must have looked at three or four hundred variations of this single image, and the actual underlying content was always exactly the same. It's this one specific photo from this one specific angle with almost no hints about where this was taken beyond that it was somewhere in Japan, which, by the way, is a much bigger country than you think it is. I know many of you are probably imagining like Hawaii, but dude, Japan is huge. Like Japan in its totality is 150,000 square miles. The city of Tokyo alone has over 1.9 million buildings in it. It's a series of islands, but it's a series of very big islands, all right? I was looking for a Microsoft Bimbo's needle in a Japan-sized haystack. And with no info anywhere on Google and two decades of digital atrophy standing between me and Microsoft Bimbos, trying to find this one specific building was a daunting task. But I trudged onward and I had kept looking at this same image over and over and over until finally I made an incredible discovery. I came across what I believe to be the first ever use of the phrase Microsoft Bimbos in the entire history of the internet. This is a Japanese website called Alf's Room. 
Active since all the way back in 1997, Alf's Room is a little-known personal blog belonging to a 51-year-old Japanese man named Adachi Yoshinori, who's been steadily updating the website since he launched it in 1997, almost 24 years ago. Now, there's a ton of personality in this website. Not, not only is it aesthetically delightful with a design deeply evocative of the early 90s internet, but the whole site is manned and hosted by Alf, a fictional character created by Adachi to be the website site's image character. Basically, Alf is the mascot of this page. Now, from browsing Alf's room, you learn a lot about Adachi and his hobbies. The man is fascinated with trains, video games, photography, music. And for each of these subjects, Adachi has built out separate pages on the site, which he calls rooms. Maybe you can hear it in my voice, but I love this website, and I, I definitely recommend you explore it for yourself at some point. But the thing we're interested in today is this, a subsection of Alf's room called Exhibition Room. Inside of this page is another sub-page labeled Kore Nandaro, which I asked my Japanese friend Maru about to just kind of gauge the tone, and he described it as meaning like, hmm, what is this? Thanks, Maru. So this page is a page where Alf and his friend would, two fictional characters, as a reminder, discuss a variety of, quote, strange, unusual, and mysterious things. This is my favorite section of the site because it reveals Adachi to be an eccentric and deeply fastidious man who's traveled all over Japan and beyond, sometimes returning to the same place decades apart and noting the changes. So, as an example, there's one page on here about this monorail station in Kanagawa. In 1999, Adachi noticed that for some reason, at the end of this line, there are three potted plants placed at the terminus of the railway, so he took a photo of it. When Adachi got home, he pulled up a video he took at that same Kanagawa station in 1992 and discovered that the flower pots were in that footage as well. And when he returned in 2002, he found that they were still there, but when he went back in 2007, they were gone. So like, really, really particular documenting of things that the average person might not notice or care about. So among all these odds and ends on the Kore Nani Daro page, is a page entitled, you guessed it, Microsoft Bimbos. So I, I click on this page, not really knowing what to expect. And what I see literally made me gasp out loud. There was, lo and behold, a never before seen photo of Microsoft Bimbos. I hope I'm effectively communicating what a huge deal this is. In all my research on Microsoft Bimbos, I didn't see this photo once. This was a hitherto unseen angle of the Microsoft Bimbos building, giving us a much better look at the building itself, including the signage and the triangular green awning on the front. And while I'm sure someone somewhere on the internet has seen this photo before, it still completely blew my mind that this existed at all. It seemed like barely anybody was aware of it. Let's see what Adachi has to say about this picture, spoken vicariously through his OCs, courtesy of Google Translate. <clears throat> Used PC and parts shop, Microsoft Bimbos. It's a suspicious name. By all means, it's a parody of Microsoft Windows. It's a used PC and parts shop, isn't it? In other words, it's a hardware store, right? That's true. But the name is Microsoft. Is that okay? With such a name? The logo mark is just the reverse of the Windows one. I think Microsoft will complain. It wouldn't be strange to come. However, it seems that the store closed around the end of 2002. Now that last line is fascinating because it means that according to Adachi, the shop is long gone, having shuttered almost 20 years ago. And as interesting as that piece of trivia is, it's still not my favorite thing on this page. See, at the top of every one of the Nandaro pages, Adachi has meticulously logged two pieces of information. First, the date that he took the photo in question, and second of all, the shooting location. The date for this one? July 20th, 2001. And the shooting location? Somewhere called Koaigi Machi. Now, odds are you haven't heard of Koaigi Machi. I, I certainly hadn't. It's a tiny town, really more of a neighborhood, located about two hours outside of Tokyo within Meibashi City, with a population of barely a thousand households and no train station to speak of. 
Now, of course, after reading Adachi's blog post, I went to Google Maps and pulled up Koaigi Machi and saw this. And while it's still a pretty big expanse of terrain, finding Microsoft Bimbos was starting to feel like a possibility. Still, with no clues as to where within this maze the remains of Microsoft Bimbos might be found, this task felt daunting. And with the pandemic in Japan still ongoing, booking a ticket and getting on a flight to Tokyo is still not an option for me. So I racked my brain about what the next best thing would be to going there in person. One of the first ideas I had was to just reach out to Adachi directly. After all, Adachi is the only guy on Earth who I know saw Microsoft Bimbos with his own two eyes. Maybe he remembered where exactly it was or could help point me in the right direction. Now, Adachi has a disclaimer on his website saying he doesn't reply to emails in languages other than Japanese, but I figured I should at least try. So hastily, I threw together a message to Adachi, dumped it into Google Translate, and fired it off. And unsurprisingly, I didn't hear back from him. I kept thinking. How can I go to Japan without going to Japan? And then it hit me. So I opened Steam and downloaded Google Earth VR in search of answers. See, anyone who's aimlessly clicked around in Google Street View for a while knows that it can get pretty disorienting pretty fast. My hope here was that the VR component of Google Earth VR would on some level help me establish a sense of direction, of familiarity, to better help me ground myself and capture the feeling of wandering around taking in the sights. A feeling that, believe it or not, I have actually found myself missing quite a bit since the beginning of the pandemic. So at 1.30 a.m. last Friday, I dove in. Before diving down to Earth, I had one last thing to do. I had to arm myself. I took the only two photos of Microsoft Bimbos in existence, the legendary original and the newly discovered one that Adachi provided, affixed them to my left arm and began my descent. It was time for the hunt to begin. I'm still not sure how it happened, but somehow I was able to clip through the surface of the earth. A deep sense of dread formed in the pit of my stomach, and I couldn't shake the feeling that some sort of eldritch horrors awaited me on the other end of this journey. Luckily though, none of that happened, and I had a really great time in Google Earth VR. Hovering above hundreds and hundreds of houses and buildings with no clear sense of where to start was pretty daunting. So I picked a random spot in Koagimachi and just started exploring.
So I don't know if you've used Google Earth VR before, but a lot of people, myself included, find it to be a pretty incredible and emotional and transporting experience. One of my favorite things to do when showing somebody VR for the first time is dropping them into this game and taking them to some of their favorite places, their childhood home, their favorite vacation spot. For the right person, take them to the right place. Damn, I sound like the G-Man. <laughs> the right person in the right place can make all the different. No, but like for real, putting the right person in Google Earth VR can have some pretty genuinely emotional results. And it's just that this is not a perspective that I knew that I wanted, but it's like the, just the most entertaining possible thing. <laughs> and I'll be damned if my visit to Koagimachi did not perfectly fit that description. And I, I can't really put my finger on what it was. Maybe it was the stillness of the street view imagery. Maybe it was the ambient music. Maybe it was the really shockingly high quality photography that Google Japan uses in their street view. But all these elements came together to really give me the feeling that I was wandering through a sleepy Japanese neighborhood. I slowly strolled through Koagimachi and just took in the sights. I walked past an elementary school decorated with the children's superhero Anpan Man past an old, boarded up, overgrown bicycle shop, a surprisingly large arcade. Ooh, they got Chunism over there. They got Initial D. <laughs> there was so much life in these still photos, like an old man kind of wandering around or some kids on their way to school, even like kind of silly, unexpected stuff, like a Hello Kitty branded self-storage facility it all kind of brought me back to that feeling of being in Japan again. And as a guy who's been to Japan a bunch of times, I don't think I fully grasped how therapeutic and important to me those trips to Japan have been until this weird free piece of software from 2016 brought me right back there. It was like all at once the gravity of the emotional impact it's had on me not being able to go to Japan and, and the, the weight and the importance that I had kind of placed on these trips, like, it all kind of hit me at once. And, um, like, I, like, I, okay, I'll put it like this. I, I had hopped into Koagimachi expecting it to be like this tedious labyrinthine experience where I'm like wandering around getting lost and confused and I'd quickly get frustrated and bored. And instead I had been totally blindsided by this like beautiful, nostalgic and surprisingly powerful Experience. I don't. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. It it legitimately knocked me on my ass a little bit. <laughs> At one point, I realized I'd actually gotten so immersed in the atmosphere of being back in Japan that I had accidentally wandered like a full mile outside of Kawagimachi and had to turn around and go back. So I kept walking. I walked leisurely through this town I'd never been to in a country I've been to a lot of times. Occasionally glancing at my wrist when I came across a building that resembled Michael's off Bimbo's. And over the next hour. That happened a lot. Like, I lost track of how many times I would wander up to a building, kind of get like a jolt of excitement that it could be the right one, and then glance back and forth at the photos on my arm a couple times and realize that I was mistaken, that the brickwork was slightly different or the windows didn't quite line up. And after a little bit, that cycle began to wear on me a little. Like, it, it got a little exhausting feeling this spark of hope that I'd found Microsoft Bimbos and then the gradual realization that this was not in fact Microsoft Bimbos, it, it began to wear on me a little bit. And like, I always knew this was a long shot, all right? Like somewhere deep inside, I knew that there was a very real likelihood that nothing recognizable from the original building remained, that maybe it had been retiled or repainted or the signature green awning that you see in Adachi's photo had been torn down or hell, maybe the entire building had been demolished. I mean, none of these were off the table. It had been 20 years since the tragic closure of Microsoft Bimbos. Who's to say there was any trace of that building left anywhere? But also, I just didn't want to ruin the feeling this gave me. I knew that the longer I spent wandering aimlessly through this town, the more the magic that I was feeling, the magic of this experience would begin to dissipate. And that's not what I wanted to happen. So I decided to throw in the towel. I, after spending an hour in there, I, it was a nice try, but the odds that I'd somehow stumble across the right building with my naked eye seemed pretty low, if that building even existed at all. So I gave up. Or rather, I was about to give up, <laughs> and then this happened.
No way. No fucking way. <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> Wait. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, dude. I found it. The, yeah, the windows match up perfectly. The thing that, that I was freaking out about actually was the awning there. Which is exactly the same. No way. No way. No way. Oh my god, I want to go in the parking lot so bad. I found it! I found it in VR! That's so awesome! Oh my god! I had done it. <laughs> Through some combination of diligence and sheer dumb luck, I had found it. No way, man. I, <laughs> bro, I, I, if I take this headset off and it's not still recording, I'm gonna kill myself. I looked back and forth between the photos and this building, and I can't describe how good it felt when it all clicked into place. Like, everything lined up. The triangular awning from Adachi's photo, which after decades of exposure to the elements had faded to a very faint green color. The pillar that lined up, and of course, that same dusty set of four Microsoft bimbos. They hadn't changed a bit. I could not stop smiling. Even telling the story now, I can't stop smiling. It was a crazy feeling standing there, or virtually standing there, in precisely the same spot that Adachi had stood in 20 years earlier, at the exact site of one of the most beloved and misunderstood images on the entire internet. But that's exactly where I was. And thanks in large part to the thorough documentation provided by Adachi Yoshinori, we have honed in on the hallowed ground where Microsoft bimbos once loomed. I couldn't even look at it without laughing. I don't know what this creature is, but... <laughs> I'm so happy. At 36 degrees, 22 minutes, 21.7 seconds north, and 139 degrees, 3 minutes, and 30.2 seconds east, is this building. The hallowed ground where Microsoft bimbos once stood. If you'd like, you can visit it for yourself in Google Maps. There's a link in the description right underneath the subscribe button. <laughs> or once tourism opens back up, maybe even head there in person and pay your respects to this legendary landmark IRL. I know I will. The experience I've had over the past month looking into this is why I love the internet. Like, here we have this Japanese guy meticulously documenting his entire life online for decades, talking to, as best I can tell, virtually nobody, and Yet, years and years and years later, one of this man's hundreds of blog entries wound up proving instrumental to helping some guy halfway across the planet 20 years in the future solve a pretty inconsequential mystery. Without Adachi's photo and the location he posted, there's no way I would have found this. He provided me with the sole piece of original writing on the entire internet from somebody who actually visited Microsoft Bimbos in person. I had to tell somebody. So I reached out to the only friend of mine who I knew would still be awake, my Japanese friend, Maru. The morning after going on this little VR adventure, I woke up to discover that I had received an email from Adachi. Here's what he had to say. Hello, Nick. I'm sorry for the late reply. The photos in this page are taken by me. However, I have never been inside, just by looking at it from the outside. I have never shopped. Unfortunately, there is no more information available. I am sorry that I cannot be a help. Alf's room manager, Yoshinori Adachi. It's funny that he ended it that way, saying, I'm sorry that I cannot be a help, because little did he know, he was unbelievably helpful. <laughs> in solving this mystery. So, Yoshinori Adachi, if you're watching this, thank you. Um, thank you for maintaining Alf's room for 33 years. Thank you for your fastidiousness in documenting the little things in life that caught your eye. Your unwavering dedication 
to taking the things that interest you and putting them on the internet um, led to one of the highlights of my year. And to everyone else watching this, be like a dachi. If there's something interesting to you, if there's something you like, if there's something that catches your eye or that you want to share or that you find fascinating, just put it on the internet. Make the blog or the YouTube video or the song or whatever the thing is that you've been thinking about making and then talking yourself out of because you think no one's going to care or no one's ever going to see it. Please, I'm begging you, make it anyway. Make it anyway and put it out there because you never know who it's going to reach or how it's going to help them. Thanks for watching and have a good weekend. Hey, one last thing. I I'm getting perilously close to hitting 1 million subscribers, which is insane. If you're watching this channel and you enjoyed this video and you made it all the way to the end, I'd love it if you'd consider subscribing. I have a video. <laughs> I have a video that I'm working on for when I hit 1 million that I'm like dying to release. And also I'm scared that it's not going to be ready in time. So I have cleared the rest of this month to finish this thing. It's a project many years in the making. And that's all I'm going to say about it for now. Oh, also, I, I have developed a crippling addiction to streaming on Twitch. I broke the table. The book is on the table. I now stream basically every morning at 10 a.m. to play the Trackmania track of the day. Long story, but if you tune in, I'll explain it. Um, and it's it's been incredibly fun. We have a really great little group of people there. It's so much more casual and chill and conversational than streaming on YouTube. So I'm gonna keep doing that because frankly, I love it. Oh, also as a direct result of not releasing a big video last month, I also didn't release a bonus video last month. So my apologies on that. You will get two bonus videos this month, I promise. One of them is up now. It's the full, very lightly edited cut of me wandering through Kawagimachi, including the moment where I stumbled upon the site of Michael Soft Dimbos. So if that sounds pleasant to you, it's like a fun little cozy ASMR thing. I figured I might as well give you all that. So yeah, if you click join on this channel, you get access to that and a bunch of other bonus videos, including commentary tracks, full interviews, and, all, and by the way, the bonus video that will be going up alongside the 1 million subscriber video is, is really something. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, like I get a lot of questions from y'all about the best way to support this channel. So if you wanna support this channel, the absolute best way to do it is clicking the join button. I appreciate each and every one of you who has done that. Um, it really enables me to keep making these high effort, dense, weird videos at exactly the pace I want. So yeah, thank you. So here's an interesting statistic. According to YouTube analytics, two out of every three people watching this video are guys. And here's another statistic. Two out of every three men will, at some point in their lives, experience some form of male pattern baldness before age 35. Another fun fact, according to YouTube, only 14% of y'all are subscribed to me. So... Maybe, I don't know, consider doing something about... That's Anyways, that's neither here nor there. If, if you're one of the majority of men doomed to future hair loss, one of the most affordable ways you can help prevent that fate is through keeps. Now, maybe you're thinking, but Nick, I haven't even started losing my hair. That's actually kind of the point. The number one way to prevent hair loss is prevention before the hair loss begins. Here's how it works. With Keeps, the entire treatment process is entirely online from your doctor's visit to getting refills. And unlike competing services, Keeps will send you a full batch of three months of product ahead of time so you don't have to pay through the nose for a new shipment every few weeks. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Nick Robinson or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Nick Robinson.